Okay, uh, we're now moving on to Chesapeake Bay and Watershed. Scott Phillips is a hydrologist who serves as the Regional Science Coordinator for USGS activities involved with management and restoration of the Chesapeake Bay and its watershed. His primary duty is coordination of the USGS Chesapeake Bay studies, and he acts as the primary USGS liaison to the Chesapeake Bay program by serving on several subcommittees and work groups. He integrates USGS findings with other federal and state agencies and academic institutions involved in the Bay restoration to ensure that USGS's work is closely meshed with the needs of federal, state, and local partners. And I believe Scott worked collaboratively with Rich Patuk at EPA on his presentation. He'll probably comment on that. And some others, right. So, uh, thanks, Mike, and good after, not afternoon, I'm from the East Coast. Uh, good morning, everybody, from uh, the, other, the other bay on the East Coast. So, uh, while I do a lot of that for the USGS, what I'm going to focus on today is more the science activities for the Bay Program as a whole. And I'll take you through this outline. First, I'll go over uh, some of the management issues and how the Bay Program restoration effort got set up. But then the majority of this talk will be on the science structure that we carry out or the science enterprise. And like uh, you'll see some similarities that you've uh, heard from the, the other two talks and probably some of the other uh, this talks this afternoon. So as far as issues, uh, the Chesapeake Bay is really trying to restore fish and wildlife populations and also try to provide benefits to the 18 million people who live there. Uh, we have a, almost 24 different, 100, 24 different hundred species, a lot of biodiversity. Some of the main species are, are striped bass. Um, in fact, about 90% uh, of the striped bass in the Atlantic Ocean spawn in the bay. We're also right in the heart of the Mid-Atlantic Flyway, so we have about a million waterfowl who winter in our region each year. Um, all this provides a lot of economic benefit for, for the Mid-Atlantic area, but we've had problems probably over the past century uh, with the amount of people we came into the watershed, we started seeing a decline in fish and wildlife species, mainly due to two, two big reasons, uh, poor water quality and loss of habitat. And that was really all caused by the population growth we had in the area, as well as some climate variability and over harvesting. So let me just talk about a couple of the key species, uh, striped bass and, and blue crabs, just so you get an idea of how these things vary over time. This is just a graph of our striped bass populations back in the, the 70s. They had really um, been decimated by over harvesting. So when the Bay Program first started, one of the big decisions to make was to put a moratorium on striped bass harvesting. And very controversial through both Maryland and Virginia. Uh, but as you can see from the graph, we had a pretty remarkable recovery of the, the striped bass populations after that moratorium. And in fact, now they're at levels that are between the thresholds that we try to manage them of, of fishing and minimal populations are the two bars up there on the, some of those thresholds. Um, another population with a little more um, Vari uh, variability is our blue crab population. If you've ever come to the land of pleasant living, as we call it, blue crabs are one of the delicacies in this area. Um, you can see from these population charts, they've been near the lower part of the threshold through a lot of the record that we have. This is from 1990 through, through the present. And it's due to over harvesting, poor water quality, and other environmental factors that affect the life cycle, which includes a portion of their life cycle out in the Atlantic Ocean. So we, we put in different harvest limits, but a big focus here is trying to improve the water quality to support fin fish and shellfish, such as the blue crabs. And the poor water quality, there's two big issues. One is low dissolved oxygen. Each summer we have fish kills due to anoxic conditions in the bay. And those um, fish kills occur both in the tidal waters of the bay and we get some up into the watershed. And then we have poor water clarity conditions, and that's caused a loss of SAV, or submerged aquatic vegetation. And they're really important. They put oxygen in the bay, they provide spawning habitat for a lot of the fin fish and shellfish, and food for the waterfowl. So initial part of the Chesapeake Bay program was to try to improve these water quality conditions. And in fact, standards were set where we're trying to attain water quality conditions, and you can see from this graph, we're only about 30 to 40% of attainment 
And so that's been a big focus of the bay, trying to reduce nutrients and sediment that come into the tidal waters that cause these water quality uh, declines. Now, when the bay program started, we started, we had some improvement in conditions. Uh, most of that was due to point source upgrades. EPA put a lot of money in, into reducing nutrients coming from wastewater treatment plants. But the conditions have been more static since about 2000. And it's this been lack of improvement because now we're really trying to tackle some of the non-point sources of pollution, especially agriculture and urban suburban runoff that led the Bay Program to move from a voluntary program to reduce nutrients to sediment to a more regulatory program in 2010 where they actually established a total maximum daily load, TMDL, for the entire watersheds, the biggest one in the nation. And I'll talk about some of the consequences of this, but it's, uh, while it's, it's led to more focused efforts to reduce nutrients and sediment, it's also fractured some of the partnership respects we've had in, in the Bay Program. Uh, we also have some variability due to climate, climate change uh, well, big storms in some places will have, uh, you know, large amounts of nutrients and sediment washing into the bay, causing um, some of the DO degradation that we have, especially in the summer months. So that gives you a little idea of some of the issues that we're dealing with. Um, when you, a lot of that issues are driven by the amount of people in the watershed, and you've probably experienced a lot of this in some of your coastal systems, where we've, we've doubled the amount of people in the watershed over the past 50 years, gone from about 8 million to 18 million from 1950 uh, to present, and then we're expecting that to continue to grow because so this is a situation where even though we're trying to restore the system and in some places conserve other parts of our ecosystem, we're up against uh, continued population growth, so that's where we're trying to bring in more of socioeconomic decision making into the Bay Program. So let's talk a little bit about the Bay Program. So it was established in 1983 uh, under the Clean Water Act, similar to the Puget Sound. And because of that, it did have a big water quality focus when it began. Uh, EPA is the lead federal agency. Uh, you can see a, a number of other agencies have MOUs to work in the Bay Program. But we also partner closely with the six states in the watershed, as well as DC, uh, legislatures through the Bay Commission local governments, and a large amount of academic institutions helping provide the science. And the way we work is really topically based, where down here we have goal teams. And those goal teams are for fisheries, habitat, water quality, land conservation. And that's where we have a nexus of scientists and resource managers working together to try to say, how are we going to restore or recover those different topic areas? So a lot of co-production right there. Um, then that goes up the food chain here where you have higher level policy managers trying to take that science and recommendations, putting into policy decisions, and then finally once a year the governors of those six states and the EPA administrator meet to talk about what has been accomplished and what are some of the directions we need to set out in the future. Science is, comes in in two ways. We have a, essentially a science coordination group that works here and then an advisory group, and I'll get into that in a little more detail. Now, as I mentioned, when we first started, thank you, we were uh, pretty much a voluntary partnership, uh, worked through a series of agreements. The first agreements in 1983 through about 2000 were all water quality focused, nutrient sediment reduction. Uh, then in the in, uh, beginning of the century, Chesapeake 2000 agreement broadened things out to look at those topics I just mentioned, fisheries, habitat, water quality. And then about a decade later, when the Obama administration came in, uh, he put out an executive order. Now this came from Tim Kaine, who at that time was governor of Virginia, and he wanted to get more federal involvement within the Bay Watershed. So at first, the executive order did not focus on science at all. Uh, and so we went through and when we were negotiating what should be in this order, we were able for them to move out from just recovery of habitat and fisheries and water quality to also consider climate change and to strengthen science as part of that executive order. So it took some work, but we got it in there. And then um, the administration's been pretty supportive of putting funding to try to back that executive order up. But as you heard in a previous 
presentation. Uh, not all of those requests from the administration has actually made it through Congress to try to help out some of these efforts. Now, the TMDL came on pretty much at the same time that we had marshaled our federal efforts. And this formed a real chasm in the Bay Program because the states now were being told what to do under a regulatory framework versus voluntary agreements. And so we had the executive order come out in 2008, the TMDL in 2010, and I think it took four years for us to recover into a voluntary partnership again where we finally signed what we call the watershed agreement where the states and the federal government agreed to what they were going to work on for the coming decade through 2025. So this agreement has 10 goals, 31 outcomes, way too many to be able to really do effectively. So we're going through a prioritization exercise, but let me uh, visualize what this looks like for you. So the big, the big overall is trying to restore and sustain populations of fish and wildlife for the benefit of the people in the watershed and beyond through bringing back their conditions, water quality and habitat, also conserving lands they depend on through different management interventions and these can be practices and policies while trying to take into con uh, concern what the future conditions could be both from population growth and associated consumption and land change as well as climate change and variability. So each of these 10 goals has an outcome and all those outcomes are measurable. We went through a long process with the Office of Management and Budget to say we will restore crabs, oysters, fin, uh, rockfish to these target levels by 2025. All these outcomes have a, a decade meeting target that we need to address. So one big issue here is trying to make sure groups aren't focused just on their outcomes, but we have interconnection between these outcomes so we have more of an ecosystems approach. And that's, that's one of our big challenges and as many of you go through those sort of challenges also. Uh, the funding behind the Bay Program, uh, federal, oops, sorry, the federal funding's around $500 million. It, it's come and it's waned over time, but, uh, you know, since we got the executive order, the funding was down here, it went up, and it's sustained pretty well over time, total funding. The majority of that funding goes for uh, water quality improvements, most of what both uh, USDA and EPA put towards the efforts are for water quality improvements, uh, and same with DOD, uh, much less of the funding goes towards fisheries management or habitat restoration. That's mostly supported more by NOAA and DOI on the federal level. Now the states put in a similar amount of money, uh, about $600 million, and again, most of theirs is focused on water quality restoration. So this is one of our big challenges. We have a, an unbalanced approach for the 10 goals we're trying to meet, and I would say 80% of the effort is into one goal, just for water quality. Um, and of that, I would say 5% maybe goes for science if we're lucky. We have federal cross-cut um, information on science. We don't have it for state, but that's, that's my estimate. So let's talk a little bit about how we're organized in that fashion. So I'll go into the science coordination and funding, and then we'll finish with tools and communication. So our science coordination, a um, couple principles. One is uh, we have a very closely linked science decision framework where we work with the resource managers on a daily basis in decision making. We do this through what we call our decision framework uh, where science informs setting up the 10 goals I talked about and the outcomes, what the factors are influencing those goals, um, it help inform what the management approaches would be, and then we have monitoring in place to assess are we getting the environmental benefits we had hoped for, and then try to synthesize information so resource managers can make adjustments to their strategies or we can make adjustments to our science. And we have two big groups. We have an advisors group and a providers group. The advisors or the scientific and technical advisory committee or STAC. And Lisa Wanger, who's here, uh, she's chair of STAC. That's 38 different representatives, mostly from academic institutions. And they mostly review 
and provide guidance on where we should go. And they're more forward-looking. They're like the Bay Program, 10 years from now, you need to be worrying about climate change because if you look at projected increases of relative sea level rise, Chesapeake Bay has the highest increase of the whole East Coast. Um, on the other hand, STAR, which is the Scientific Technical Assessment and Reporting Team, this is more where we try to coordinate the science to provide it for the topical areas that I mentioned earlier. And this is different agencies as well as academic institutions, and we try to support the management needs of the goal teams. So let me try to illustrate this for you. So this is our science enterprise. So up here are the goal teams dealing with these different topics I talked about, ranging from fisheries, habitat, water quality, healthy watersheds, stewardship, and leadership. Here's STAC, the advisors. Here's STAR, trying to coordinate the science from all of these providers. And these providers range from folks that are down at the Bay Program office, so GIS team, to federal partners, state, local, academic, and NGOs. So a couple things here. Um, we carry out, we work directly to try to prioritize the science needs of the goal teams. And as I mentioned, we have 29 outcomes. We can't meet them all. So we go through a, usually a biannual prioritization process of what do you need the most for monitoring or modeling or other aspects of your science. Uh, then we will look to the providers. And usually these different folks have a certain area of expertise. And they will be lined up to try to work with these teams. So for instance, you, there's an oyster work group here, a crabs work group. Well, NOAA has people on, on those. There are some academic institutions helping support those. So as you can envision different expertise, one, one way they work is directly under work groups with these teams. But we don't want it stovepiped. So this is where the science coordination comes in, where we have a bigger group of functions we're trying to carry out. And these are some of the major functions. You know, monitoring is one large cross-cutting function where we have a group trying to do, look at integrated monitoring, another group looking at the data integrity behind it to support the status and trends work or indicators for those 29 outcomes. Then we have a group trying to explain ecosystem change. Well, we can't explain that whole diagram I have up earlier. So this is topical. Right now we're working on nutrient sediment is our main topic given the TMDL. Um, we have a group in charge with modeling, mostly water quality based. A new group just got set up to try to inform potential impacts of climate change. Another group for information management, GIS support. And we have working sessions to try to synthesize information to help inform decision making. So to try to get these in some sort of organizational structure under our science coordination group, STAR, we essentially have work groups for those t functions I just went over. And this is where we have the science providers interacting to try to say, you have this network here, you have this network here, how can we better align efforts to address some sort of monitoring for crabs or other topic? Uh, and let me just give you an example of how some of this might work together after I talk about the science partners. Incidentally, these work groups, uh, they meet once a month. They all have a coordinator who's funded full time to try to carry out their duties. Um, and so here's, uh, a flavor of some of the partners, you know, some of the usual suspects. Uh, within the states, we work a lot with their, their resource management agencies or their water quality folks. Uh, we have over a dozen universities. A lot of them are, are focused and coordinated through the Chesapeake Research Consortium, as well as STAC. Uh, and then we have different NGOs that we've been working with more. Uh, and as I mentioned, the way they interact uh, with the resource managers is either through these topical work groups or through STAR. Now here's how we try to fund it, and there's no magical way to approach this. We use any way we can think of, multiple approaches. Um, a lot of times the federal and state folks, they bring their own resources. Um, we have certain expertise within USGS, so we have our own science plan of, to say, of those 30 outcomes, there's about 10 of them we think we can help with. So we work within our own internal programs to line those up, so we have about $11 million we put towards the effort. NOAA, Fish and Wildlife, similar approaches. Now to make sure there's not 
redundancy there, we do have a federal coordination group that when we put these work plans together, uh, we're making sure we're aligned. Uh, at the beginning when we had this executive order, you know, there was a lot of turf battles. Everybody was saying, what, what's in it for me? And we had to really get beyond that take what we call an abundance mentality of saying, look guys, this is a complicated issue. There's something in here for everybody if you get beyond your turf war and start working together. And that took a couple years for that evolution to occur. Um, EPA, as the lead federal agency, um, really also provides resources that can go out through interagency agreements, as well as they'll set up RFPs for particular topics that are open for academic institutions and consultants to um, put forward proposals for. And then the academic institutions, uh, some of that's coordinated through the Chesapeake Research Consortium, but most of it's individual researchers who already have some funding from their university to go in and tackle a particular topic, uh, but they will try to look for grants from other, other entities to try to help with that work. Uh, and as I mentioned, I think some of the biggest challenges here uh, we have more needs than we have resources for, so we have to go through this prioritization process. Uh, trying to align what different groups are doing is very difficult, and um, so we'll have to uh, move on from, from some of those challenges. Let me try to finish up with an example of how some groups worked with uh, water quality monitoring, and that is you know, we had uh, a need to set up monitoring throughout the Bay Watershed uh, to look at are these nutrient sediment practices working? And so when we went in there, uh, we found that all the states were doing different ways to do that. So we took uh, two years where we worked with all the partners. We said, what, are, what do we want to try to do? We said, we want to try to look at trends. That's going to take a 10-year investment. We also need to look at compatible data. Uh, we examined the data essentially came up with a report of how to approach it and signed an MOU to move forward together on it. So uh, what, what that has now come into is having monitoring stations, about 120 of them across the watershed. Uh, not all of those have the 10 years of data we need yet, but they will finally. And this is what it's, it costs about $6 million to do that. And that's mostly people bringing their own resources. And this is what we get from that, be able to look at what the yields are in the watershed highest yields in the red, lowest in the blue, so people can target where they put practices in, and then we're able to look at what the trends are, um, in green improving trends, orange degrading trends, so people can see that half the sites were having improving conditions, sorry about that, um, about a quarter still degrading conditions, and this is what's used to help inform some of the TMDL practices. Uh, and then we have a website to get this through. So just finishing up on tools of communication, we have three major tools we work with, models, um, monitoring, mapping, and then indicators. Uh, most of the tools we have are focused on water quality. We lack a lot of the ecosystem tools. As far as mapping, we're trying to not get into looking at each of those outcomes, so we're trying to look at how outcomes are inter interrelated. You know, where are the healthy watersheds in the 64,000 square mile area that can support brook trout? that have adequate stream health that we can put land conservation practices to work in. So we tried to do mapping exercises to say, in these darker areas, that's where a lot of those coalesce, so this is where we should focus our efforts to benefit multiple outcomes by aligning partner activities. As far as indicators for each of the 29 outcomes, uh, we've got an indicator where we try to look at what's the influencing factor that might affect achieving that outcome are we doing what we said we were going to do? And then are we getting the desired benefit? Uh, I think for the 29 outcomes, maybe half of those have an indicator. So we're really incomplete given them all the monitoring we have to do. So this is a, a big challenge, just trying to get the monitoring to set up these different indicators. As far as communication, uh, we have multiple audiences that range from policymakers to implementers, interested public. And so as many of you know, going through trying to translate that to different levels of understanding can be really uh, challenging. And so when we try to synthesize, we take the mantra of less is more, in that uh, you know, the, the resource managers up at this part trying to make decisions can't use all the data and science we put out. So we need to be able to work with the scientists to get your 
findings and interpretations and sound scientific footing, but you need to refine that more when you're starting to talk about the implications for decision makers, and then you need to refine and distill it more when you're giving them policy options. So just to summarize, um, you know, we really depend on this science decision interface. Um, groups of both providers and advisors try to emphasize long-term investments in modeling and monitoring, and then use that to evaluate the adaptive, uh, evaluate and adapt in this decision framework. So I guess for to finish up, all this takes uh, a lot of perseverance and passion, and as all of you in the San Francisco Bay know, uh, you've been at it a long time. You know, my little story in the Chesapeake is my great-grandfather made his living on the Bay hauling goods and serve, hauling goods back and forth. Uh, my dad got interested in this. He got me into the water. I jumped in the water and said, I'm coming out just dirty. What's wrong with this? Well, we need to fix it. And finally, that's passed down to my daughter, and she says, we can't over Harford's oysters in one of her grade school projects. So sorry if I went over time, but thank you. more people who wanted to ask questions than we could accommodate the last time. I think from this point forward, if you have a question, please raise your hand and I'll point at you in order and someone with a microphone will come around. And then if you wouldn't mind stating your name and who you represent. Lindsay. prioritization approach? Yeah, so that's where uh, STAR comes in. We, we have the goal team leaders sit down at a table with, with the STAR leadership, and we say you get two things that you want to focus on that you have science needs are. They usually come in a list with 10, and we negotiate back and forth on what those two things could be based on what we have in hand uh, and what they feel, feel their heart, highest needs are. Hi, Steve Culberson with the uh, U.S. Fish and Wildlife Service. I was interested in your pyramid of moving information up to the decision makers. Can you describe that with a little more detail and maybe with some specific examples? Sure. Um, you know, we found, like, we found that a lot of decision makers don't want this fire hose of everything we know. So what we've tried to do lately is had synthesis sessions where we will bring in a handful of the decision makers with a handful of the lead scientists. And we'll spend a day trying to frame what information is going to be most valuable for them for policy decisions. So we usually try to come in with four or five questions beforehand, and then we'll start going through the science, and they'll go, no, 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 you know. And we'll, we usually get to about, you know, a handful of major findings that they need to understand and use for policy decisions. And then we'll, we've put that information into a webinar, usually then get it out to a broader audience. But they sort of have the, what they need based on that interchange between the scientists and the policymakers. Does that answer your question? Scott, I have a, I have a question for you. Um, one thing you didn't touch on is how you manage the vast amounts of data you collect in that program. What, what's the strategy? Uh, we have a strategy, but we don't carry it out very well. So we have a, a Chesapeake information management system uh, that's supposed to house all this information. Um, that system's, like many things, have been focused on water quality, so trying to broaden it out to include the other topics uh, has not gone very well so far. So, so right now, it's different agencies manage their information, and we basically have web services to get to it, but we don't manage it in a relational database. I'm Robert Charney with the California Department of Water Resources. Um, following up on the setting of priorities, how frequently do they change? Because these are battleships. Many of these issues take a long time to resolve, and you can't keep changing the um, ground under the folks that are trying to deliver on those questions. Right. So um, the long-term priorities are a decade. Uh, we do biannual work plans. Uh, but we said the science projects really 
at a minimum last three to five years. And if you want monitoring, you're looking at a longer period of time. So um, they've, they don't, I think the set, the foundational priorities don't change much. They usually just get added on to. Um, and that's where if we, if there's a new partner that's come in or if we can find an NGO who might be doing something we weren't aware of, we can try to meet that need. But trying to shift to meet the additional priorities has been difficult. Hi, um, Anitra Pali with the Department of Water Resources as well. I was wondering about your prioritization process. You were talking about how you sit down and you make decisions about what the priorities should be within these different groups. But do you have a grant program that I would, wasn't, might, might have missed that, but that backs up, I mean, that, that's sort of part of this process? Or is it just simply a group process, a group dynamic? Uh, it's more the latter. I wish we had a grant pr program. Um, so we, we'll work with uh, the Habitat group and they'll say we want to look at habitats supporting brook trout and wetlands loss. So we will first beat the bushes to see if we can find all the science providers who are doing something on those two topics and see what we can do under existing resources. And then if we can talk EPA into it, we might be able to set up a small grant to hit a piece we don't want to. Uh, but with the TMDL, EPA is very focused on the water quality. And I'm looking at this as a evolving process. Uh, we're in the midpoint assessment of TMDL. We're halfway through. So I'm hoping things will free up after 2017 to hit some of these different topics. Thanks. Joel Baker, University of Washington. In one of your slides, Scott, you had, I guess they were your goals, you know, habitat, fisheries, things of that nature. And on the right-hand side, it said leadership as one of your goals. I wonder if you could speak to what that means. So that's, that's more where the upper-level policy um, makers are, and that's where we, we house uh, the decision framework of trying to go through and every two years say what progress have we made and what do we have to do differently. Um, so that's, and they deal with all the budget cross-cut budgets, et cetera. That's, that's the group under leadership. All right. Well, thanks, everybody. Appreciate it. Thank you, Scott.